so welcome to this uh, special GCV GCV uh, webinar. Um, today we're going to be um, talking about uh, the uh, COVID crisis and funding opportunities that may arise from uh, from this crisis. And I'm delighted uh, I'm delighted to be um, um, to be hosting this webinar, which will actually be moderated by our founder and editor in chief uh, James Mawson. Um, who um, who will who will be uh, who will be moderating a panel of seven participants, um, and the seven participants well we have today are Jonathan Tudor from uh, Centrica Centrica Innovations, Jack Crawford from Impact Venture Capital, um, and uh, then uh, then of course uh, James Fisher from who's a partner at uh, Figure Drinker, Biddle and Reeves. And from, um, from Silicon Valley Bank, we have uh, actually four panelists. Uh, we have Alex McCracken, Managing Director at Silicon Valley Bank UK, Tracy Isaac, Managing Director uh, at Silicon Valley Bank uh, in the Bay Area, Harry O'Brien, Head of uh, Silicon Valley Bank Lift and Strategic Investments, uh, and Ifrat Turgeman. Um, Managing Director at uh, SVB Capital Fund of Funds. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, sorry for the slightly premature, premature start without much uh, preparation here, but um, seems like uh, we, we've pressed the broadcast button by by mistake. So um, let's uh, let's kick it off if uh, if we're okay with that. So uh, Jim, um, just uh, just a, a few words for introduction. Yeah, yeah it's happy to do so, Kelly. I think. Uh, uh, you'll need to show your screen as well. It's, uh, it's switched off, I think. Um, and okay. okay. Uh, Can everyone see the screen now? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, I think it's uh, it just moved off when it when you started the broadcast. So um, so welcome. Thanks very much, Kellyanne, for being able to set out this. My name is James Mawson, founder and editor in chief. As as you say, delighted to have such a you know wonderful sort of group of people to give a quick context about what we will try and do today. Uh, I'm mindful that a few more people will be joining on on the hour itself. Uh, but just to give a quick context um, about what we're trying to do, it's very much this came out of a discussion that we had last week with a group of CBCs under Chatham House Rule, where they were talking about some of the main concerns or issues that they were thinking about. And then Jonathan Tudor suggested a webinar, uh, given that he's Technology and Strategy Director at Centrica Innovations, about how we can think about structuring and what some of the funding issues are. So. We'll spend the first few minutes of the presentation running through a little bit of data, providing hopefully some fairly up to the minute data around deal flow in the first quarter, how that compares, and maybe getting uh, some perspectives uh, when we go into the discussion around that, how people are seeing it in particular. And then the sort of main part would be also perhaps an idea, an opportunity that we might be seeing this time if you think about historical downturns. This is one of the first times that we've seen lots of corporate venturing units with a long track record, very professional, well-managed teams. And I just wonder whether there might be some different opportunities or different ways that we can look through at this technology and into that. Uh, so, so Jonathan, Jack, Jane, uh, Tracy, Alex, Barry and Efrat, delighted you've been able to join us. Thanks very much. Jim, um, if I could take uh, if I could take the word uh, for just a few a few uh, minutes and um, present a few things from our quick poll that we were trying to uh, we were trying to run. Please. Um, so when when we uh, when we did the email send out last week uh, last week I mean yesterday um, for this uh, for this. Uh, rather quick webinar. Uh, we also included a link to a very, very uh, brief survey with uh, just several questions. Um, despite the um, heightened interest in this webinar, um, very, very few people actually answered the survey, but I, I thought I'd share some of the questions, what the questions were and uh, some of the preliminary results. Keep in mind, that um, there were only 11 people who have answered so far. So one of the one of the questions was, uh, are you changing your investment strategy in light of the um, COVID uh, pandemic? And uh, it does seem that for a significant number of the respondents, it, uh, the answer might be yes or or most likely. Um, for the the other 
question that we we asked there do you expect to have more or less capital uh to deploy this seems to be seems to be promising or encouraging in a in a, in a sense uh, because 45 percent say same 18 percent say um even more than than they have now so this uh, this does seem promising uh, however we we would need to see uh, more answers to that uh, to that survey, and um, if, um, if if you believe that it's less it's less capital, are you having capital withheld internally? Only ten percent, uh, or only about one person uh, in this case has said uh, has said yes. Um, two more people have said potentially, and uh, most have said uh, no or are not sure. Um, so what I what I'd really like to uh, and 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 the final question of course is uh, would you be interested in joining a networking group uh, organized by GCV uh, to uh, look for alternative funding models during a downturn and if you select yes uh, we will um, contact you via email once uh, such a group uh, is uh, is set up so uh, once again I do encourage everyone everyone on this call to um, have a look at this survey um, to uh, take a stab at it this is the link to the survey I will uh, provide the link um, in the chat section that appears on the right hand side of your of your screen you could really take um, it would probably really take you less than a minute to to complete it it's as you saw it, it's just several questions uh, it would be great feedback uh, for us as a service provider to the venturing community and to the venturing community itself because uh, we are keen to share these results with uh, with you guys hello and welcome to gcv and analytics and um and uh, and 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 share them and share them uh in an aggregate form of course uh with uh, with everyone. So um, so with that, um, I conclude my part of the presentation. Uh, turning over to uh, to Jim again for a few words on on our organisation. Yeah, perfect. Thanks very much for that. Uh, perhaps just before um, we really sort of kick off with the introductions, I'll just give a, a few of the people on the sort of webinar uh, a, a perspective. So global corporate venturing is very much a sort of trade paper trade association thinking about how the corporations invest in or support startups and entrepreneurs. And that might be investing directly in them or indirectly as a limited partner in venture capital funds. It's one of the publications that we do alongside Global University Venturing, thinking about student and faculty startups and spin-outs from particularly the top 100 universities around the world. And Global Impact Venturing, which looks very much around the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And in particular, how governments are trying to support and collaborate to the ecosystem. So, as well as doing these types of webinars and to the GCV website, globalcorporateventuring.com website, we pull together the academy. So there's some training, professional development, the analytics, which Callianne runs to help understand the data and what it means. And then we're delighted to have groups like Centrico and others as part of the GCV Leadership Society to make sure that we really understand what the future leaders of the, the industry are trying to do, given that the top 20% of corporate ventures do about 80% of deals. Now all comes together through the GCV Connect platform and the events that we do. So next slide. So in terms of the sort of publications, we look at the top 10 sectors and we look at the most important uh, top 15 or so innovative regions around the world each year. And we do a number of special reports, whether it's the Rise of Stars and Emerging Leaders, the annual review, which we call World of Corporate Venturing, the oil and gas reports and various sector reports around 5G is coming up in the April edition. We did one on ag tech, uh, and then we do the power list, which is around the top 100 people. Next slide. As I mentioned, we are uh, struggling a little bit with the coronavirus at the moment, so a lot of people are calling in or speaking from home. Uh, but we do do a number of events, both virtually, uh, such as these webinars and a digital forum that we're planning for the 3rd and 4th of June to help sort of corporate venturers engage with their sort of peers around the world and also particularly with their portfolio companies and the entrepreneurs from say Ox University of Oxford or Set Squared and the European Commission in order to think through how this new world order will come together and collaborate but that, uh, that uh, digital forum is just one of the types of events we do in real life we do the GCV Symposium, GCVI Summit and various others across Brazil, Israel Japan and New York and Houston.
So just to give you start with little... your with your one second, Jim. Before you start with your introduction uh, uh, the discussion to the data, um, just a few just a few reminders. Uh, one reminder to the uh, to people from the audience watching us live. Um, there is a question section on the uh, right hand side of your of your screen. Uh, where you could submit your questions, and uh, towards the end of the call, we will try to answer as many as many as uh, time permits us to answer. And uh, one more reminder to the speakers: um, it's it, it might be best to mute your microphone while you're you're not speaking in order to avoid um, any sort of uh, any sort of sound distortions. Uh, so unless you're speaking, um, better to keep it uh, to keep it muted. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks very much for that. So to give a little bit of context and framework before sort of I invite each of the, the speakers and uh, guests to give a little bit of their background and perspectives and then we break into a, a discussion. I wanted to broadly try and look through some of the data that Kalyan's helped prepare for this slide to kind of get an understanding of why and how corporations have been increasingly active in direct and indirect investors over the past decade. And then to try and get a sense of how the coronavirus and its COVID-19 disease is slowing the global economy and making it potentially harder to do direct deals and for related reasons, causing the C-suite or the chief executives and others at the large corporations concerns over their balance sheets and what that might mean. And I think this might create opportunities to create corporations to be open up their structures to different third parties to effectively leverage their corporate venture capital units or find different ways to make sure they're supporting the entrepreneurs while retaining their innovation capacity. So we'll come to that in a little bit of time. So if we look through the data in terms of this, what you find is obviously since 2010, when Global Corporate Venturing was founded, we've seen a pretty rapid and sustained increase in activity, both in terms of the value of deals, reaching a high point in 2018 at Corporations involved in $164.9 billion out of a broadly out of a global industry venture capital total of $250 billion, according to PitchBook, and nearly 3,000 or so deals at its high point last year. Next slide. Now, when you break that down month by month and quarter by quarter, one of the things obviously everyone's very mindful of at the moment is whether the coronavirus and the impact it's likely to have on the global economy will slow deal flows. Venture capital in particular and corporate venture has historically been a pro-cyclical industry, i.e. there's been more deals done towards the end of an economic cycle and less done at the during the downturn or at the start of the next one. And so you if you uh, if you think about the, um, if you think about uh, therefore what we're likely to see, obviously the U.S. jobless figures have come out last week with 6.6 .6 million, which was effectively double the week before. So that's effectively 10 million Americans alone, which have been made redundant and making jobless claims in the past couple of weeks, which is unprecedented, you know, sort of unparalleled figures, and that kind of puts a, an indication of what sort of impact there might be on the global economy. So you would naturally expect in this downturn that sort of the March figures in particular, given that's had the sort of most recent data and the most recent chance for the impact of the coronavirus to, to show in terms of deal flows. And we have started to see a decline year on year compared to March 2019 and compared to the first couple of the months of the year. And we'll talk through on the discussion panel on what that might mean and what we could potentially expect going forward. But we're already seeing in terms of the deals uh, a decline. But bear in mind, many of those deals that were signed in March were actually perhaps agreed a little bit earlier. They just hadn't necessarily been announced before or they had already been effectively committed and, and people were still closing through. So it would be interesting particularly to see what the Q2 numbers look like. Next slide. So um, in terms of thinking about, uh, for the next slide uh, about the sort of fundraising part of the equation, um, you know, one of the things that Global Corp Prevention through GCP Analytics has been tracking is the sort of indirect commitments, both, you know, how corporations act as a limited partner in other venture capital funds, but also potentially in terms of new unit launches themselves. And then you can also track whether those new corporate venture unit launches, i.e. owned by a corporate itself, potentially raises third party capital. 
And so we've seen sort of a number of new launches consistently launched each quarter um, and each month. Uh, and so what we'll start to see is again, an interesting point where we'll see fewer new corporate venturing units launched from Q2 onwards, just as potentially corporate balance sheets are put under more strain. But potentially we can start to see some interesting collaboration or co-investment opportunities as potentially other financial limited partners looks to back CVC units, or whether corporations start to switch more towards commitment to VC funds as perhaps a lower cost and more effective way of you know, allocating capital and retaining innovation capacity and what that might mean for CVC units. So next slide. And in terms of that final piece, you know, one of the things that we've seen is the sort of corporates increasingly complementing any direct investment or in-house corporate venture unit they have with third-party commitments to VC funds as a way of sort of complementing their strategy. You might see a corporate venture, a corporation have an in-house unit. It might fit with an in, in incubator or an accelerator. They might have more of a private equity later, shape, uh, later stage buyout operation. But they're also thinking about how they can work with top-tier VCs in maybe in different regions or in different sectors to develop out more white spaces and create the partnership and opportunities. And certainly we've seen an increase both by the number of those commitments and particularly around the valuation. Next slide, please. And then this is the piece which I think could be quite interesting and potentially different is that if you look at the sort of the, the vintage year when corporations were setting up a corporate venture in units, what we found is there are now more than 500 corporate venture in units with a 10 year or more track record. That's both sort of individuals within units, but in particular the corporate venture and units themselves. So what we've started to see, and this is the first time we hadn't had that when we went into the 2007-8 global financial crisis, we certainly hadn't had that in the dot-com area in 99, 2000. This degree of professionalism and experienced cohort of managers and individual within teams. And so as we go through the coronavirus, potentially this is quite an interesting opportunity, I think open for discussion when thinking about structuring units. Obviously, typically units have either furloughed or stopped doing new deals, they've furloughed their team. You know, some of them have shut down their corporate venturing units. So DuPont has closed its ventures units at the end of March. You know, and others have thought about, well, maybe you know, we are less strategic about this, you know, we need to be more financial or vice versa, and they've sort of changed and up, up uh, and changed their programs. And I think what potentially is interesting for this current economic downturn is the fact that there are so many corporate venture units with good financial results, professional teams and professional units with more than a 10-year track record that potentially could be opened up to third party capital. And if you bear in mind some of the big private equity firms, someone like Blackstone raised a quarter of a trillion dollars in the last year to as dry powder that they could apply in different strategies. There's a lot of sovereign wealth funds, there's a lot of pension funds which have wanted more allocation to venture capital. They've just struggled to find good managers to be able to do so. So the top 21 VCs last year that raised more than 500 million in the funds is 21. But even if they expand out the number of different types of funds that they do, like Andreessen Horowitz has a bio fund, or Sequoia has different funds for Israel and China, as well as the US, and different strategies, growth stage, as well as early stage. There's only a, so many of established groups with more than a 10-year track record of good performance that money could be allocated to, potentially. So in this environment, I think one of the exciting things could be how does different external limited partners come in to support uh, the corporate venture and ecosystem if corporations are suddenly open much more to understanding how, uh, how that could leverage their resources and perhaps make it cheaper to retain strategic innovation capacity without necessarily furloughing or closing down with the reputational damage that brings to both the industry and to them as individual corporate venturing groups. 
So we've seen just out of that sort of list, out of the, say the 25 last year, we've seen a number of different types of strategies that we can come through and we'll sort of open up to the discussion on what they might be eh, as we go through the different options. So at that, I will now sort of open up for the discussion and I will ask each, each in turn to say just a few words about themselves and the background in their unit. We'll start with Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan from Centrica, if you want to sort of open up and uh, give a little perspective about Centrica and yourself and your own background. Sure, thanks, Jim. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Tudor from uh, Centrica. Centrica is a UK-based but global energy company. We've, uh, I'm head of strategy and technology innovation there, where we have our um, corporate venture unit, uh, where we invest broadly across the energy transition from mobility, electrification, and the way that we're trying to decarbonize the way we heat our offices and, and homes. Perfect, thanks so much. Jack. Hi, this is Jack Crawford. I'm the founding general partner of Impact Venture Capital. Jim, thanks uh, uh, for including me today and thanks for your leadership during this turbulent time. Um, Impact Venture Capital is a financially focused seed investor that collaborates actively with corporates. Uh, we're leveraging technology to create uh, real world solutions and sort of a tech for good. And what we've seen is corporate venture is focused heavily on AI and has a growing interest in the SDGs uh, as it relates to agriculture and transportation and even things like security. And so we're excited about uh, the tailwinds um, that uh, corporate venture, as it focuses on artificial intelligence and these SDGs are providing uh, in creating return opportunities for seed stage investors like like Impact Venture Capital. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Jim. Yes, hi, it's uh, Jim Fisher from Faker Drinker. Thank you uh, again to Jim and the group for allowing us to participate. Uh, we are a firm of about 1,300 lawyers in the US, China, and Asia. I chair, along with a co-chair of the corporate group, we're about 250 lawyers uh, in the US, Asia, and China. Uh, we focus quite a bit in the area. Look forward to the conversation. Wonderful, delighted. And then from Silicon Valley Bank, uh, Tracy, do you want to sort of lead off from your side and then introduce in turn uh, your colleagues from, you know, and we're delighted being able to join you, bring so much value from a, from a bank's perspective and so it's useful to have so many different parts from your organisation to bring some of the insights to the discussion. So, Tracy. Hey, Jim, um, I, I got a note that unfortunately Tracy uh, couldn't join just before, oh. so it's Alex McCracken here, I, I'll step in. Um, <laughs> and then introduce uh, my colleague Afrat afterwards and then my colleague Barry will join towards the end. Um, so Alex McCracken, I'm a MD for corporate relationships for Silicon Valley Bank in Europe. Um, we as a bank are a commercial bank for tech companies across the globe and also venture capital and private equity funds. So we have about 40,000 tech clients and three and a half thousand VC and PE funds that bank with us. Um, we also do a lot of venture lending uh, to the tech companies, MedTech and Life Science included. Um, so with that, I'll turn to Efrat to introduce herself and SVB Capital. Hey, uh, thank you guys for having me. Excited to be here. Uh, my name is Afar Turjiman. I'm Managing Director at SEB Capital, uh, the investment entity of Silicon Valley Bank. We've been around for 20 years. Uh, we have $4.5 billion under management with two uh, main products, a fund of funds and a direct fund. Um, excited to be here. I've been with the platform for 12 years in various roles and with the fund of funds in the past uh, two years. Perfect. Well, thanks very much, Alex and Nefra, for being able to join. Jack, Jim and Jonathan, uh, we didn't choose you just because your first name letters, first letter of your name began with a J, but we're delighted that you could bring your insights and wisdom with us. So there was a, there's a sort of joke doing around that sort of Alex flagged up, which you can you know, create variations of, which was what was the biggest factor behind a company becoming more digital or open to corporate venture capital optionality? Was it through the CEO? Was it through the CFO? Or was it due to COVID? And I think, you know, there's certainly a, a good question that could be made that actually the sort of coronavirus and the COVID-19 is actually causing people to think through more about their workflow, what they do. And obviously, there's a big impact on terms of the entrepreneurs and the venture ecosystem more broadly. Obviously, the primary factor when thinking about this is 
human health and uh, people's happiness and you know it's a complete tragedy what's been going more broadly so i will open up to the first question which is perhaps jonathan from a cbc perspective and an efrat from svv capitals point of view and then jack you know are you guys already seeing a deal slowdown or do you think that people will be able to plow through this and if we start with jonathan around the corporate openness to external ideas and financial interests in that space so jonathan in terms of deals what are you guys seeing uh, it's been a bit mixed, if I'm honest, Jim. We, we've seen a um, couple of portfolio companies still manage to close rounds. I, and again, I think they're the ones who were stronger anyway. Um, and, and the current crisis, in a way, uh, allows them to perform better because they're more in the home services. So they've seen their business um, pick up. Uh, elsewhere, we've seen and I've heard term sheets being pulled at the last minute. Um, some VCs as well as CVCs dropping out of deals. Um, it, it just as drafting um, is starting to begin. So I think it, 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 it's a mixture at the moment. I think it's, there's just a lot of um, nervousness, um, people waiting around the portfolios, just giving guidance around, you know, cut fast and, and, and uh, learn to live within your means for a little bit longer. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble is kind of the message I'm consistently hearing. Very good. Efra, what's, uh, what about SVB Capital from an investment perspective? Yes. So from the conversations we had with our underlying managers in the past couple of weeks, uh, all, uh, luckily all of them are, are well funded or about to close uh, new funds will have fresh capital to invest. But they are being uh, very focused on triaging the portfolio, supporting their CEOs, uh, still taking meetings, but admi admitting that they're not going to take any large bets in the near term until they get a sense that valuations adapt to the, to the new life that we're uh, in and, and everything else. Um, I'll echo what my uh, colleague just said uh, around uh, term sheets being pulled and, and uh, some of those um, scenarios that we're seeing around us, but uh, very much, um, I, I think we're gonna see a little bit of a slowdown in the next couple of months, okay. at least. So Jack, uh, from an early stage or from an impact point of view, what are you guys seeing? Yeah, maybe I'll just make one quick comment, Jim, on our deal flow pipeline and one quick comment on our portfolio. Uh, the pipeline is growing rapidly, and I th we think that's because angel investors are pulling back uh, their, uh, their early investments into seed and early stage companies because the public markets are so down. Uh, and so maybe we're getting more of their uh, deal flow volume. Uh, the venture capital firms broadly are primarily supporting uh, follow-on investment opportunities in their existing portfolio, so they are uh, less available as a capital source for some of these seed and early stage startups. And then I think the general view by the entrepreneurial community is that corporates may take too long um, mm -hmm. to participate given the current turbulent environment. Uh, and so I, we think we're getting some of some of the deal flow that would typically uh, inure to the benefit of of corporates. So that's we think that's interesting on the deal flow pipeline side. Obviously. There are a lot of new companies that are are trying to demonstrate that they can uh, they can endure and maybe thrive in the the new normal that we're we're all enduring as it relates to COVID. And then just one quick comment uh, for for you sharing an experience on the portfolio side. Clearly, uh, there's a portion of our portfolio that is scaling back and and and, and trying to weather the storm, cutting headcount, uh, reducing expenses, doing everything possible to extend the runway. But uh, a significant portion of our existing portfolio is thriving in the current environment. And that's because they, as an example, we have a company called SiriusMD that is providing remote access uh, to connect doctors and patients using a HIPAA compliant mobile platform. So obviously they're doing really well in this environment. We have a, we have a company that is providing virtual video access to health and wellness, health and wellness benefits uh, uh, consultants. Uh, and so they're doing really well. We have a robotics company called Advanced Farm uh, that is uh, picking strawberries in the field when there's, you know, worry, there, there's worry by farmers about, uh, you know, sort of groups of people uh, working, working closely together. So their technology is being adopted. And then finally, there's some uh, autonomous, uh, you know, retailing. We have a, we have a, a cashierless shopping solution. Uh, you can imagine how that is being adopted at this rate and, and some other things in the autonomous space. So just briefly, uh, the, the, port, the subset of our portfolio that is focused on virtual or autonomous, uh, autonomous or uh, any portion of uh, sort of remote access to healthcare seems to be thriving in the current environment. 
really good. And Alex, given from a bank's point of view, you bank so many entrepreneurs. I think in a, in the preparation to this, you had a sort of a, a good insight in terms of more holistically what's happening in, around some of the entrepreneurial venture backed portfolio. Sure. Well, uh, I'd echo uh, what our fellow panelists said around telemedicine. Um, MedTech is, is going through the roof, digital health. Um, but also on the consumer side, you know, a lot of entertainment, um, gaming, fitness apps, uh, anything that people are using digitally to keep themselves occupied at home. And then, of course, on the enterprise side, a lot of corporates have obviously um, adopted not just remote working, but a lot more slicker digital solutions. And we certainly have as a bank. So. On the B2B side, I think those companies that are selling to large enterprises are fairly well insulated in this environment, as a lot of corporates uh, go to digital. And I think this COVID crisis could be a massive opportunity for a lot of the venture-backed companies that are being adopted by corporates um, as consumers adopt to the new normal of working from home why would they travel when they can do that extra zoom call um, they can get that food delivery at home and adopt a lot more uh, than they already have so i think there there will be some real winners here but no doubt the next few quarters and maybe even longer than that are, are going to be pretty tough for everyone very helpful thanks alex be interested just from uh, again from your perspective given the diversity of funds you commit to as well as the portfolio companies or entrepreneurs you bank with you know whether you get a sense that the runway is going to be enough if it does go on for a couple of quarters or if it's a v-shape people will be happier or you know how's how's it you know have you started doing any modeling any perspective on that side yeah i mean uh everyone us included our, and our venture friends have focused on anyone who's got less than six months cash runway um or or um you know impacted by the sectors um i think they may end up in in the red zone um but i think in terms of modeling what we and others have encouraged is is a variety of scenarios a three-month lockdown a six-month lockdown maybe even a 12-month lockdown and assume very little revenue growth if you're lucky that's your you know that's your best case scenario but assume a big revenue drop as your worst case and then see how much cash you're going to need in in those three nine and twelve months lockdown scenarios and i think then of course um letting the investors and, and the bank supporters of the company know what your cash needs are going to be um have weekly views of your revenue and how that's tracking in this environment and be having those conversations with your investors and your lenders uh to keep them fully informed and of course banks and, <clears throat> and venture funds will definitely support the top 30 percent of the portfolio in the in the green triage um on the yellows you know if if it's a short-term hit but a a medium to long-term gain and they'll survive through the scenario they'll probably get supported as well with internal rounds um but but let's be honest some companies with a short cash runway very heavily impacted by travel being cut um have probably got to be quite realistic and either cut costs even more dramatically or think about pivoting um so i think people have just got to be pretty honest that this could be a long lockdown but nobody knows quite yet so plan for the worst hope for the best keep talking to your investors and, and lenders yes. sounds good advice thanks alex i appreciate that and then on the other side of the equation sometimes these exogenous or external shocks to the system i don't think anyone was particularly expecting a, a viral impact this year they might have expected an economic downturn given the length of the uh, of the growth boom we've had over the past 10 or so years but but no one was particularly expecting this to be the trigger, I don't think, and to be quite so severe in terms of lockdown. You know, it does seem unprecedented times. But sometimes those, those shocks can actually open people up, both from a corporate and other perspectives, to newer external ideas or financial interest in possibilities. 
you know, uh, a lot of people can go from a fixed mindset of how they do business, how they scale, what's expected of them, to more of a, a growth mindset and saying maybe there are different opportunities, maybe there's some pivots or some technologies that could actually help or make things more effective and allow business to operate. So I'm just open and interested on that question. Perhaps we'll start, again, we'll start with you, Jonathan, from a corporate point of view and then perhaps effort more and Alex from a bank's point of view again is do you see there's this sort of corporate openness to external ideas and then Jack uh, from your point of view around um, around uh, you know some of your corporate clients how you're doing and, and then Jim if you can bring in some of the legal perspectives about you know openness being good but what does that mean from a legal point of view we'll start Jonathan with you sure right just think here, I mean, the, the, the strategic reason why we and many corporates get involved with this is, is not because of, you know, we want to deploy capital, flip it over, generate an IR, ROI and an IRR. Right? It's more about the the optionality we create, the insight that we get um, uh, from from the the investments to help us do our own strategic business development, if you like. Now that doesn't evaporate in a in a down and it, it may shift in a priority to some extent you know what can change is uh, you know the corporate and the parents willingness to release capital to support that activity i mean where we we are right now is you know we're, we're facing the same challenges as many companies so there's a big unknown about well, how much capital can we allocate to this kind of activity now even prior to to covid if you like we, we'd been starting to think of you know, are there alternative ways that we can do the corporate venturing, right? There's, everybody talks about off balance sheet or separate fund, et cetera. But I think you, you, some of your data had already started to suggest it was, you know, where there's a mixture of institutional capital with um, that kind of financial discipline. But the, the insight that many corporates can bring to the table for a GP, for example, about how a market functions, how it how it doesn't, what's going to be needed, what are what are the beliefs about the sector? That there's a, a much richer vein of information there that exists in many traditional VCs. And so, could there be a way of bringing uh, uh, both sides of the opposing side of the table? Sometimes the classic VC with the with the corporate CC closer together in these situations and we we've certainly had in the last week or two uh, um, an initial number of conversations around that which probably would have been less of a priority on our side um, seen more senior up um, and same in other places so perhaps it could start to catalyze a, a broader discussion of well how can we how can we do even more with less um, which is the sort of mantra that we've been talking about internally for the last sort of 10 days or so is you know we don't want to get rid of the activity but you know we may not have the same amount of capital to deploy so how can we achieve the same or even more without um, deploying the same amount of capital by working with more financially geared partners okay Efrat, what's uh, from a svb capital's perspective what do you what do you think about these types of things yeah, so I mean, well, it's, there's no doubt we're facing the most challenging global crisis of our lifetime, but we all believe that we'll get we'll get through it, and it will be, uh, you know, up to all of us here on on the call to get the economy thriving again. And the opportunity for technology is greater than than ever. Uh, as Alex mentioned before, we'll see a paradigm shift from corporate um, saying we'll go digital over time to we have to go f fully digital now and that will create incredible opportunities uh, incredible opportunities for, for startups um, you know corporates will rethink their real estate needs uh, connectivity uh, that will have a secondary effect around like cyber and infrastructure technologies and more broadly the ecosystem and the investors there's no doubt that the, the tourists and the newer funds uh, without a proven track record will, will disappear at that time. And I think that will allow the long-term investors who've been around through cycles, uh, who will have a, a, you know, a long-term view to take advantage of the, uh, of the opportunities and the new models and the, the, the innovation that will come post-crisis. So we're, we're very, from a business perspective, very bullish about the opportunities. Good to hear. Thank you. Jim, uh, from a sort of legal point of view, given that you sort of obviously look at through a lot of deals, you also see a lot of corporate venturing units and help them. There's a lot of challenges around employment, furloughing. You know, there's a lot of issues around structuring or doing these 
types of potential external capital coming in to units. What are your perspectives more broadly in terms of how you see things in the current crisis and what you think from a legal point of view, how you could be creative to potentially work through some of them? Yeah, sure. So a couple of things I would raise. The first is I think it'll be interesting to see how sort of there, if there will be a shift in sort of corporate or parent oversight uh, over some of the venture community and specifically the CDC community, how much will the parent uh, want to come back in and, and maybe once I seize control, but be more involved in kind of the investment portfolio and more involved from a strategic perspective on how it impacts the, the overall uh, operations of, of their institution. And the other point I think that's going to be interesting is just the diligence exercise. You know, for, uh, for many, many years, you know, the diligence exercises have been pretty straightforward. Most people understand how you go about doing diligence for deals of this size, depending on uh, you know, what stage the companies are involved in. But clearly, there's going to be some some different perspectives on what we now want to look at uh, from the standpoint of, of how this crisis impacted folks, how it uh, potentially will impact their not only their valuation, but just sort of their their legal documents, insurance issues that are going to certainly come up and already have come up. So it'll be interesting to see how those uh, how those issues impact uh, sort of the speed with which transactions get done, and also what the focus areas from the legal perspective are. Then, of course, how we translate that into the drafting, uh, what uh, what will change, and, and it certainly will. There's no question that things have already begun to change, not only in term sheet drafting, but uh, actual legal documents. And we'll need to, to be thinking about that and, and focus on what areas uh, of improvement can exist and come out of this uh, this situation. Wonderful. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. And, and Jack, again, you've run an independent VC. You work closely with corporations. You think about a slightly different perspective. Does it throw up opportunities if you see corporations responding differently or perhaps being more open? What do you think, from your perspective, that might might be coming out of this? Yeah, Jim, we're seeing some interesting things. I mean, we feel like we're learning a lot uh, from uh, the uh, corporate venture groups that we're collaborating with closely. Uh, and they're informing us on where we should be spending our time and where we should be investing uh, by enlightening us with the roadmap or their acquisition strategy. And we've had companies that have, that have been acquired by Intel. Uh, you may have seen two weeks ago, Pondera Solutions was acquired uh, by Thomson Reuters in an eight-digit transaction. So we're quite excited about how the portfolio is mm -hmm. performing and our collaboration is it, with these corporates is working. But I, I'd also say just, you know, at, at the practical level and experience sharing a little bit, we, we gathered market insight from Yamaha 18 months ago in a video interview that I did with them where they talked about automation in the agriculture space and their enthusiasm for robotics. And here we are 18 months later as a co-investor with Yamaha in Advanced Farm, this, this uh, robotics company that picks strawberries. We're, we're doing deal flow exchange calls with companies like SK Hynix uh, and sharing you know, deal flow. And we've, we've now co-invested alongside of Intel and Baidu and Kubota and Goldman Sachs. Um, we're adding value to our portfolio companies by collaborating with our corporate partners. The president of Sprint just joined the board of one of our early stage portfolio companies. So what we're finding is that each stage of the, the, the venture capital process, we are trying to be um, a good collaborative partner with these corporate venture groups. And it's working to create returns and it's working to create uh, exits. Uh, so we're, we're, we're excited about um, uh, that collaboration and looking to deepen and broaden our relationship with corporate venture groups. Perfect, thanks Jack, appreciate it. So if we think about sort of different options for structuring and funding the units, uh, perhaps I'll sort of run down uh, a number of the different ones that people have already been trying. I think Jonathan already mentioned that a number of groups have already been thinking about this, they've been trying or exploring different ways. These might get accelerated as we go through this coronavirus. And perhaps we can then think through some of the pros and cons and what factors might go into structuring these options. So I'll run through a quick list of you know, some of those different options that we've seen and some examples. And then perhaps we can open up the discussion which ones might work for different types of organizations and different issues around uh, being able to structure them and, and, and how they can make them work in that way. So just, uh, just off some of the deals that we've seen, we've seen, say, a spin-off corporate venture capital unit which has become more independent, but still with a majority of corporate cash, such as SAP did with Sapphire. We've seen corporate venture capital with minority corporate cash and financial limited partners, by the ventures, Cheetah Mobile with SVB is perhaps another type of example. We've seen in-house corporate venture capital with the parent still, and with traditional financial LPs coming in as third parties, Swisscom with pension funds, or Sony with its innovation growth ventures, with local banks in Japan. 
We've seen corporate venture capital with a parent and private equity cash, such as Deutsche Telekom or Telstra with Harbourvest, which returns cash and also enables them to do new deals. We've seen corporate venture capital with government cash as third party, such as SoftBank with its vision fund. We've seen corporate venture capital and family offices, which creates different types of potential conflicts or opportunities, such as Fiat, the car maker, through Agnelli's XOR, or Virgin, or perhaps even Amazon, you know, where they've got the Alexa Fund, and Jeff Bezos also does personal investments such as Blue Origin. Then we've seen private equities at CBC, where Blackstone, Carlyle, or TPG will think about how they can create a growth opportunities fund to support their portfolio companies and help their innovation effectively as well to make sure that they return deals from their buyout side of things as well as real estate or other opportunities. Then we've seen university with corporate venture capital, Oxford Science Innovation has a partnership with Tencent and um, Google and others, Cambridge Innovation Capital or MIT Engine perhaps be good examples there. Multi corporate venture capital, the OGCI or oil and gas uh, fund, we have about a dozen or so oil and gas majors are co-investing together. SoftBank has a deep core AI fund with Yahoo Japan and Dentsu. We've seen a Russian IoT or Internet of Things transport fund between some of the big state-owned enterprises there. Monsanto and Microsoft did a Brazil fund and Green in Japan as a GVR fund as well with multi-corporates uh, coming together on specific topics or specific regions. Multi-corporate venture capital with government or financial and or financial investors, such as Astor's second fund. And VC with lots of corporate and financial LPs, such as Emerald or Chris Licks. And VC as a service, such as YouFirst or Touchdown or perhaps even 500 startups or maybe you know other uh, those types of things where they can offer to help and support corporate venture in, you know, but it's done as an external service. Perhaps even SVB could come into that. So there's a whole host of different options that have already been tried. Who wants to sort of kick off with a perspective on what types of pros or cons could be considered when you're thinking about opening up and what sort of areas or timings might mean that it's a, it's a good opportunity? Perhaps uh, Effort and Alex, you want to kick off from your perspectives, you cover a lot of different types of structures and you work with a lot of different corporations. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kick off. I think um, obviously we've evolved our model over time um, with our first funder funds maybe 25 years ago, and I'll, I'll let Efrat talk uh, talk to the evolution of that. But from from my perspective in Europe, um, you know, obviously if uh, if a fund is uh, mature and has very very experienced managers that know a sector um they're incentivized and retained you know that is that's a good starting point and then the larger the lp and the larger the commitment they probably want um you know a very good experienced longevity corporate that has that has done cvc for a long long time because the pension funds and the larger lps want to uh, invest quite a lot of cash and kind of just let the gp get on with it um i think where an lp is um perhaps you know struggle to get into top vc um there's plenty of cvcs as you've said um but I think it's really around does the LP judge that team to be sufficiently experienced, have the sufficient access to the best deals in a particular area um, and uh, and be able to convert, not just get access to the deal flow, but convert the deals to wins by maybe the corporate value add programs that that exist. And of course, the better CVCs have very good links into their business unit but i think if you're a financially driven lp you just want to see the most experienced well incentivized retained team that has deep links within the corporate um before you even think about making your lp commitment um Efrat, what what are you seeing and how have we evolved uh svb capital structures over time as we've grown Yes, thanks, Alex. So just to give some context, SCB Capital was founded by our current CEO, Greg Becker, and Erin Gershenberg, who's uh, the leader of the fund-to-fund -fund business for the past 20 years. 
At the time uh, when they formed uh, SCB Capital, they realized that uh, SCB is a, sits in a unique place in the innovation economy and can provide LPs, you know, differentiated products and access to the innovation economy. We've started our first fund with $120 million, uh, raised mainly from family offices and a, and a small investment from the holding company, from the bank. Uh, but since 2008, due to Volcker regulation, uh, the bank can no longer be an investor. And so over time, we've evolved the LP base. And today we have blue chip LPs like Florida State Board of Administration, Calsters, Japan Post, Dan Danish Growth Fund, and other top global LPs. Um, the, the bank is, um, the owner of the management company and the, and, and, you know, the economics are split between the, the partners and the holding company. But as Alex mentioned, I mean, we believe, and we know that our advantages are really around the data that we have and relationships, market insights and access and our ability to be a value add LP. And all of these are possible just because um, the way we structured the business and how integrated we are from a business perspective with the bank and, and the senior leaders uh, at the bank um, who, can, who can support the business and be, be uh, well aligned with us. Hopefully that's Thanks, helpful. Alex. Thanks, Jeffrey. So Jonathan, just as you think through Centrica, as you mentioned over the past 10 days, you've done some thinking, are there sort of certain types of models or structure that in, inherently seem more interesting or appealing than perhaps others? And how would you go about thinking about pros and cons in that sort of light? Well, we haven't got as far as structures yet. I, I, there was there's was some reflection though from what Efrat and um, Alex were talking about. The, the, the one thing that I've definitely learned is you do not use the S word in front of um, institutional investors do not use the word strategic because they just think you're anything but financially disciplined right um, so you change the word from uh, strategic investor to synergistic investor that were aligned with founders and institutional investors and um, us as a corporate wanting to use our channels and blah blah blah, blah. that was that was the first big learning um, definitely from from our side but if, if you take that then concept of you know, let's find synergy between what we're trying to do here, right? So from the point of view of the founder, uh, corporates are attractive. Okay, we, we've got capital, but the, it's, that's not usually the problem if it's a good, good company in a way. They want access to our customer bases. And when we collectively have millions of customers and access to those sales channels and the revenue potential for us and the, and, and the ability to help them scale faster, that's what they're really after. And that's not what a traditional VC necessarily can give them as, as readily as, as we as corporates can, right? I, I think the, the thing that the, we've done as a sector, as, as corporates, has grown up. So we know how to do transactions now. We we know how to turn up, look, smell, and breathe like a, a VC, and, and understand the terms which are going to be obnoxious. And we also understand how to to support founders to do what they want to do to build um, great companies. And so there's there's a closer meeting of minds now. I think when it gets to how we then do restructure that. I think the more that we as corporates start to become not necessarily dependent, but more involved and entwined with the kind of institutional capital world, we need to realize that, again, same old adage, keep things simple. So it, it, we tend to start to speak a lot more about traditional GP, LP structures, and, and then it, it starts to just coalesce around. So if we're bringing multiple corporates together, it's is there enough of a strategic overlap of our common areas of interest? So you know, for three or four years ago, from us as an energy company, we, we, we kind of looking at mobility because we knew it was going uh, to be electrified, but we didn't really understand the world of an automotive player and the, the tier ones and all the supply chains and how they lived and breathe. And the, 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 the opposite is true, where we've had a number of conversations with that kind of automotive sector are increasingly looking at energy now as a replacement of some of their margin loss around the electric vehicle supply chain. You know, those those words aren't necessarily coalescing, but they're certainly colliding a lot more frequently than we, we said before. So there's a strategic overlap question is can corporates come together around a table and have enough commonality? And then are those in sectors that institutional investors really believe and think there's room for exponential growth to drive the value 
through those sale, existing sales channels that are going to give the type of returns that institutional investors are uh, aligned with. And, and so the mechanisms that we're really discussing are just the traditional ones because that's what everybody's familiar with. That's one less layer of complexity that we'd have to start to deal with. Okay, good. And Jim, from a legal point of view, I mean, obviously you've handled not just the deals, but the sort of fund structuring, VCs, as well as corporations, different sort of approaches, models, any sort of pros and cons advice to be able to share in terms of how to think about going about these types of uh, approaches? Well, I certainly think you're going to see more syndicates come about, and I think you're going to see them in a couple of different ways, uh, you know, from the commercial side of CBCs with respect to how they interact uh, with, with portcos that they're involved with, and also just from the structure of uh, venture capitalists working directly with corporate venture capitalists and what's important to them uh, on each side of that is, is in some cases very different. And so the structuring is not only uh, what I would say uh, interesting from the standpoint of how they come together, but how you draft for what's important to them, especially in, uh, in heavily regulated industries, uh, digital health being one of them, we've mentioned a lot about that today, right, healthcare in general. So structuring for not only the, the financial return and the synergistic return, but also just for what's important from a legal perspective is likely to, to change a bit uh, throughout the next couple of months as we see how this, this world has uh, begun to change. And then again, I would just go back to you know, sort of how people uh, are, are going to look at transactions and can they, can they structure themselves in a way where they either delegate to, uh, to one or the other or maybe a small group of people to the diligence certain aspects that can cover the, the whole of the, the transaction or are there going to be more sort of which is typical as we all know today where there's uh, a lot of piggybacking on diligence or are people going to want to do more of their own sort of in-depth analysis of, of sort of the investment opportunity and, and what is important to them as a, as a, uh, as a standalone as a standalone company and then lastly I would, I would say I think joint ventures uh, you know it's something that we're starting to see more and more of uh, and have over the last couple of weeks um, in terms of just people coming together to try to mitigate and spread out risk uh, a bit. So obviously with that mitigation of risk, they come a bit of mitigation and reward if they make the right decision or if their uh, investment pans out. But in terms of just sort of trying to continue to create deal flow and to continue to be involved in transactions, trying to come together to create syndicate to mitigate the risk model uh, of, uh, of an investment is something we're starting to see. Okay. Thanks, Jim. And uh, we're coming up to the final sort of minute and a half or so of the, the webinar in terms of the timing. So, Jack, just in terms of very shortly, you know, um, how easy do you think it might be for, for corporates if they think about this, given you've raised your own fund and you, you're, you've got plenty of experience dealing with, uh, with LPs? Yeah, I mean, I guess my experience is, Jim, uh, corporates broadly are, appear to be looking for the most effective and lowest cost way to crowdsource innovation. And, you know, how are they going to do that? I, you know, my, my sense is that if you look at, I guess, what's, you know, just as a specific example, what's happening in the, the, the transportation space, there's a lot of corporates that are interested in looking at electricity as the new fuel and how does that impact mobility. Um, they're looking for uh, a cost effective way um, to you know, gather market insight, get access to deal flow, collaborate with partners that can help lead and support the the you know rounds of financing, uh, maybe even help with portfolio management, adding you know management talent and customers to to companies they invest in. My direct experience is that corporates are starting to conclude that partnerships with VC firms is the way to um, effectively crowdsource innovation in a way that allows them to average down their fees and carry as they co-invest alongside the managers they back. And so as a Perfect. specific example, we have a couple of corporates that invested oh, into our- We're going to have to just cut out there a bit, Jack, I'm okay. afraid. We're coming to the final few seconds. So I just want to make sure I say thank you very much to everyone for being able to join. Uh, I think we will start to see some blur in between VC and CVC as those partnerships happen. I just want to say thank you to you all for being able to join. Thanks to everyone for listening. This, pod, uh, this recording will be uh, published afterwards. So uh, please take a look and join in. If you've got further questions, don't hesitate to let us know. Thanks very much to Kelly Ann for preparing the data as well. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Thanks all. Bye-bye.